excited to do this type of collaborative program. Uh, professor Gorski is an associate professor of integrative studies at George Mason University, New Century College. He teach, where he teaches classes on class and poverty, educational equity, animal rights, and environmental justice. He recently designed the new social justice undergraduate program and minor there as well. He has been an active consultant, presenter, and trainer for nearly 20 years. He looks young. He looks too young for that. But conducting workshops and providing guidance to schools and community organizations committed to equity and diversity. He created and continues to maintain the Multicultural Pavilion, an award-winning website focused on critical multicultural education. Paul is serving his second term on the Board of Directors of the International Association for Intercultural Education. He has published four books and more than 40 articles and publications such as Educational Leadership, Equity and Excellence in Education, Rethinking Schools, Teaching and Teacher Education, Teachers College Record, and Teaching Maryland. And Teaching, that's a separate magazine. Maryland had um, Teaching Tolerance. Prior to his current position, Paul taught the University of Virginia, University of Maryland, and Hamlin University. He continues to publish and present in education-focused forums on topics including white privilege and racism, anti-poverty education and economic justice, and multicultural organizational transformation. He lives in Washington, D.C. with his cats, Unity and Buster. <laughs> and I understand from today, he's also an adjunct professor for us here at Berea College. So please join me in welcoming our, our speaker, Mr. Paul Pierce. You know, if we can just figure out how different racial groups can get along with one another, everything will be cheery and sweet. Then whack! Oh, it's institutional. It's bigger than individual relationships. Okay, I'm starting to get bad. And then whack! Oh, it's global. It's connected to a history of imperialism. And on and on and on. Now, I easily could deliver a talk about implicating myself at any of these levels. But recently, I'd say the last year or so, a couple of experiences conspired to give me the latest whack, and that whack flattened me. Okay. Okay. Experience number one, the International Multicultural Institute, 
a nonprofit in Washington, D.C. Uh, I used to do some work for them, sent an email uh, about who was receiving its annual Leading Lights Award for Workplace Diversity. One of the recipients was Sodexo, a copy with a long and worldwide history of human rights abuses. Sodexo actually has received several awards for workplace diversity. The idea, I guess, is that if you have a diverse workforce at the corporate headquarters, it doesn't matter that you refuse to pay workers in the field a living wage, or that you fire workers who are trying to unionize. It doesn't matter that human rights groups found that you were abusing workers in Colombia, the Dominican Republic, Guinea, Morocco, and the US, denying overtime pay or paying the lowest legal wages. Hey, even if you treat your most disenfranchised workers as disposable, as long as the suits in your corporate office play nice with one another, you get a diversity award. Now that got me thinking about the University of, just a little bit more uh, information about Sodexo. Um, that got me thinking about the university where I work, which is George Mason University outside of Washington, D.C. It has been recognized and celebrated as one of the most diverse universities in the U.S. At the same time, the university is full of underpaid Sodexo workers, a vast majority of whom are people of color, and most of whom are immigrants. Sodexo runs Mason's Food Services. I believe it also runs uh, Korea's Food Services. I hate to think about how many times I went to a campus program on racism in higher education, then met some folks for lunch or dinner on campus to talk about the program, never raising the issue that by giving our money to Sodexo, we were actually contributing to racism. That makes me a hypocrite. Another experience. The middle of last year, I was editing an essay my partner Jennifer had written for a graduate class. She was writing about the exploitation of animals for human profit, and buried in her essay was this line. Animals don't exist for human entertainment, sport, or utility, and we ought not to deprive them of their vital needs to satisfy our trivial needs. Now take a moment to think about that. I haven't been able to stop thinking about it since I originally read her essay. Now, just for fun, or maybe the opposite of fun, if you have a purse or a bag or anything with you that has any kind of cosmetic, whether it's lotion or hand sanitizer or makeup, just take out one item if you have, if you have a bag with you that has something like that. Chapstick, lip gloss, fingernail polish, uh, Okay. Now, uh, look at that, look at that item. Look at the packaging. If that does not say on it somewhere, this product was not tested on animals, what that means is that animals were tortured so that you could have that product. They were forced to ingest it. It was rubbed into their eyes. Let's see some pictures of what that looks like. Now, you might look at your hand sanitizer and think, that's not trivial to me. That's vital. Well, no, because you can buy shampoo and cosmetics that weren't tested on animals. It's less convenient, maybe. But if you have any leisure time at all, and if you can afford to pay a little more for those products, and I realize not everybody can, then that is an example of depriving living creatures of their vital needs to satisfy your trivial needs. Now, that example is about the exploitation of animals, about how, okay. um, that was an example of the exploitation about animals, how, how elephants or dolphins or race of horses or greyhound dogs are tortured to satisfy our trivial cravings for entertainment, how farm animals, uh, how farm animals are tortured to satisfy our trivial cravings for cheeseburgers or chicken breasts, how foxes and other animals are tortured to satisfy our absolutely senseless cravings for clothes made with fur so that we can all look as silly as her. That's, that's okay. I, sh I shouldn't pick on Lindsay Lohan. I, I apologize. Um, and really for me, that ought to be enough. 
These are living creatures, and research has begun to show how all animals have a consciousness that is similar to the human consciousness. They feel fear, they feel pain, they grieve, they know when they're being tortured. But then I got to thinking about this quote in a different way. This is my grandma. My mom's family is from poor Appalachian stock. They, like most people in Appalachia, were subsistence farmers at one time. Two industries put a terribly violent end to that, the coal industry and the lumber, lumber industry. Uh, and now remember, of course, that white people in that region themselves, when my people first moved there, were occupying land that in many parts of Appalachia were stolen from Native Americans. So we're talking about several layers of violence here. Coal and logging companies did so much destruction to the land with their clear cutting and runoff and their pollution of waterways that many poor subsistence farmers had to stop farming. And uh, what work was available to them? Uh, in the case of where my grandparents grew up, the, the men's choices were go into the military or go to work for one of these industries that is destroying your community. Uh, several, several of the most recent generations on my mom's side of the family were coal miners. Uh, then, like now, of course, as many of you know, coal mining is among the most dangerous exploitative industries. Now, I started thinking about grandma and the generations of men my family lost to black lung and cancer and other ailments associated with the coal mines. And I started thinking about the pristine beauty of Appalachia and how much of it has been destroyed right out under the poor people of every racial and ethnic background. And that helped me make the connection. Um, th this is really my hypocrisy here, which is that when it started happening to my people, that white Appalachian people, when it started happening to my people, all of a sudden I got some consciousness about it. Now, when I choose how I'm going to live, what I'm going to consume, what corporations I'm going to support, this is what I'm choosing. I'm choosing the extent to which I am going to deprive people, most especially disenfranchised people, poor people, people of color, children, of their vital needs to satisfy my trivial needs. I am choosing the extent to which I am willing to support the worst of global racism and sexism and economic injustice for the sake of convenience or for the sake of the social cachet that's attached for owning this or that trivial thing. So this is my topic for today's talk. I'm a hypocrite, and while it is true that I've dedicated most of my life to confronting racism and white privilege and economic injustice, and while I think I've done some pretty good and important social justice work in my life, it is equally true that even a basic reflection on the ways I participate in consumer culture, the everyday ways I live my life, that I contribute to what I have come to see as the most destructive forms of racism and economic injustice, the ways I deprive disenfranchised community of their vital needs in order to satisfy my trivial consumption needs. Now, I'm going to be talking about some pretty difficult stuff here, about connections among various types of violence that has taken me a whole 40-year lifetime, 41-year lifetime, to start talking, taking seriously. And that made me rethink just about everything I thought I knew about what, what it means to be a social justice educator and activist. So before I get into those examples, I want to share with you a couple of kind of cognitive tools that have helped me make sense of this massive exploitation and how it's tied to my patterns of consumption. Uh, the first concept is intersectionality. How many of you are familiar with that term, intersectionality? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, then you probably know Kimberly Crenshaw coined this term to describe the recognition that different forms of identity and exploitation um, are intersectional. Uh, so intersectionality generally refers to uh, intersections between human identity categories and oppressions like sexism, racism heterosexism, homophobia, and so on. Now, I have come to believe that the entire